Good morning, everyone. My name is Casey Anderson. I'm with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support, and I'd like to welcome you to an introduction to the lean process. Before we get started and I hand it off to our speaker today, I'd like to go over a few simple house cleaning um, or housekeeping issues. The first is that this webinar is being recorded. Second, you all have the ability to ask questions today by looking on your GoToWebinar menu and there's a questions pane. If you type questions throughout that, there'll be times where we pause to answer questions throughout the webinar, and so we'll do our very best to, to answer all your questions. Additionally, this webinar will be accessible on WorkNet uh, once the archive has been put up. So um, with that, I'd like to hand it off to our speaker today, and we hope you enjoy the webinar. Good morning. My name is Charles Lidke. I uh, am here today, hopefully for about an hour or so, to give you a, a high-level understanding of what the lean process is all about. Uh, with about an hour for something as uh, as broad as this, I'll do my best to be uh, brief. And, uh, and and as uh, Casey said, anybody that has any questions, uh, obviously with the number of folks in this webinar, I may not be able to address uh, all of them, but I'll try to choose some pertinent ones. And uh, do feel free to ask questions because uh, I never exactly know if I'm getting through unless uh, I see the feedback that I'm getting. So I really appreciate it. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about uh, uh, about us as soon as this works, there it goes. Uh, we're an organization, Illinois Business uh, uh, Innovation Services. We've been in uh, uh, in business since the 80s. And we basically uh, train and consult with organizations by helping them learn how to make improvements uh, uh, on their own with our assistance. And really just helping companies uh, solve problems and uh, make improvements. And that's about what we're gonna be discussing today as well. Uh, we, we work in a, a variety of organizations, not just for manufacturing, as is, is a good segue into lean, because lean is not just for manufacturing. You're all a dramatically different audience. Uh, I myself have uh, been with this organization since 1992, and I've worked with a lot of manufacturing companies. I work with several hospitals, uh, working with a bank right now, a lot of not-for-profits and governmental agencies. So uh, sometimes people like to say lean, not just for manufacturing anymore and, and there's nothing further from the truth. So that's a little bit of an introduction uh, about us. We're going to go over several things today. I'll just let you know what kind of issues we're going to be addressing. We're going to talk about what the overall goal of, of doing anything would be because what do we want to accomplish in the first place. We're going to talk about different types of work and where we should focus our improvement. I've, I've worked with organizations uh, for a long time and have been out of university since the 70s and have spent my career helping companies improve either as an employee or as a consultant. So we'll talk about where our focus should be. We're gonna talk about one of the most important words that uh, you've probably heard uh, about, and that's the word called waste and to make sure we understand what that is and why we even focus on waste. Why don't we focus on other areas of the operation? So we'll spend some time having you get an understanding of that. And then we'll talk about what tools there are to help to reduce or eliminate the waste. There's Lean is a, is a, uh, uh, a process that has a substantial number of tools and it's important that you know what the tools accomplish. Um, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail and we wanna make sure we're not using something that's inappropriate. We'll talk about making decisions closest to the people who are actually doing the work, which is one of the fundamentals of, of the lean process as well. And then uh, uh, finally, the transitioning from using tools to creating a management system and then eventually having a different culture uh, in an organization. And we'll spend some time talking about that too. And then I'll have uh, an opportunity for questions at, at the uh, very end. So let's jump right into it. Uh, what are we trying to accomplish is the first question uh, that we're going to answer. So I, I was thinking about processes and going to a bank and, uh, uh, and uh, signing up for a new account or going to a uh, uh, getting a new license or the voting process and those, these things. And one of the terms that I hear people use quite a bit, and so many of you may have also used it as recently as this morning, uh, is the word red tape. And so I wanted to look up what red tape means. And uh, a lot of people throw that around. And there are things that people believe that we shouldn't have to do. I like the words oppressively complex 
time consuming, foot dragging, things that we don't understand that need to be done uh, uh, that sometimes get in the way of us accomplishing what our uh, desired result is. And uh, there's some examples of, of what can be red tape. And by the way, red tape isn't necessarily bad, but it's something that looks like it stands in the way. Uh, getting licenses, I'm not saying licenses are bad. In many cases, uh, they're important things to have. Having multiple committees approving a decision or, uh, or, or filling out additional forms when there's no obvious reason for that. So some of these things are, uh, are, are issues that we're faced with on a regular basis, red tape. Uh, another issue we're trying to deal with is what we call do-overs. Uh, what to do over uh, a new attempt or some a chance to do something that we tried to do once and for whatever reason it was not successful it didn't work it just didn't wasn't correct and uh, we keep doing it over again I think about going up in an elevator and people press the button four or five times because they aren't sure whether or not it's working whether or not the light's working or just because they're impatient so we have do overs besides red tape. Red tape slows us down. Do-overs make us uh, redo something uh, uh, when we did it once. And I always like this. We, when somebody says, I'm waiting in line, I'm next in line. I always tell people I'm the worst one to stand in line behind because invariably I choose the slower line. And, uh, uh, and unfortunately, some processes work with glacial speed. So these are some of the things that we're faced with on a regular basis uh, uh, as just regular consumers. And so the question is, why should we do anything at all? You know, what's the motivation to do anything at all? Traditionally, whether we're getting reimbursements, whether we're selling something or whatever, we have costs. And, uh, uh, and people chuckle when they look at this slide because sometimes they say, what's surplus? Uh, but that really gets to the, the point of things. If I want more surplus and I don't change my cost, then I just ask for more reimbursements. And you see that happening on a regular basis. And in the world of reimbursements going away, that makes things more difficult. So in the old days, we would look at our costs. We decided what extra we wanted. And that's how much money we'd ask for, whether we're selling a product or whether we're asking for for uh, uh, for cash from another entity. Uh, lately, and this has been quite a while now, uh, the formula is different. We're not in control of our surplus anymore. The surplus or lack thereof is a result of whatever reimbursements we're getting and whatever our costs are. And in the world of reducing uh, 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 funding, reducing reimbursements, reducing prices, uh, if we don't reduce our costs, the surplus goes away. And obviously for organizations, we need a certain amount of money to be able to continue to service uh, our constituents. And that's what we're looking for. So folks have to understand that there is a focus on reducing costs. Uh, that's nothing new, that's not changed. Maybe the type of cost we focus on, uh, but it amazes me how many people and companies just believe that we can just keep charging more and more or getting more and more money to do the same thing over and over again. And there's nothing furthest from the truth. So does this look familiar? We stand in line and we're waiting uh, uh, for things to get done and not sure when it's gonna happen. And people get frustrated and people get unhappy and on both sides as well. This is what happens on the other side. You know, there's the perception that we're sitting around with nothing to do. There's all kinds of, of uh, activity, all kinds of paperwork, all kinds of bureaucracy, red tape, et cetera, that we're trying to focus on. So the organization then learns that they have to work around issues, that they go through, they jump through hoops, they go through Herculean efforts to try to make things happen. And they really happen when they use the hero mentality that we, uh, uh, that we had somebody fly in to save the day. The folks who need our assistance, need our services, learn to be very patient sometimes. Sometimes they're not very patient. They decide they can go elsewhere. If they're able to go elsewhere, they certainly do that. And if they can't go elsewhere, they dread the process. And unfortunately, they dread those involved in the process if they have no other options. And those are issues that, uh, that are really important for us to deal with. So we talk about what the goal is. And there's a couple of folks who came up with uh, some pretty good ideas. Taiichi Ono was an executive at Toyota 
back after World War II when Toyota started to revolutionize the world on changing the uh, process of making cars. And, and he talked about the, what we call the cash to cash cycle that we're looking at from the moment somebody walks in the door until they leave satisfied, whether we're giving them a hamburger, whether they're giving, we're giving them a permit, whether we're registering them for a process, whether we're delivering them a vehicle, it's all the same thing because there's essentially work that's involved and that's what we're trying to minimize that amount of time. Uh, between walking in the door and walking out the door fully satisfied, 100% complete. So Taiichi Ono leads us down that point. Uh, Dr. Shigeo Shingo, one of the prime architects of the tools that Toyota used to accomplish this, talks about improvement. And he said, there's four reasons we improve. We want to do things easier. We want to do things better. We want to do them faster and we want to do them cheaper. And that's the list the, listed in the order of their priority. So that's what we're trying to focus on is to, to execute all of those in whatever we do because all work is a process. So what we're trying to accomplish, we're trying to make it easier for people. Safety, a critical uh, uh, a characteristic we should be measuring. How do we make it easier for people? How do we make things better for people? How do we make it more likely to be correct instead of having to have the do-overs on a regular basis? How do we improve productivity and, and uh, our delivery as uh, uh, on a timing that's expected? How do we make things uh, more quickly and still having them safe and having good quality? And when you look at safety and quality and then our productivity, productivity and delivery, the result be, becomes cost that is better managed, that's reduced to the level that's appropriate. We're not talking about cutting out all activities and costs regardless of what the organization needs to deliver to the client or customer, but we're talking about driving that down to as low as it possibly can be. So that's really when we're talking about improvement and what's improvement going to happen over time. Well, the first thing we do, we attempt to create a standard because without a standard, you can't have improvement. I can't have a problem if I don't have a standard level of expectation. We'll spend a little time talking about that as we get later out into the uh, uh, end of the session. We create a standard for a particular process. All work should have standards. We track performance. And we might notice that we have performance above the standard. We might notice we have performance that dips below the standard. So we have what we call a gap, the gap, the difference between the standard level of expectation and the current level of performance. And our job first is to close that gap. If we close that gap, that's not improvement. That's merely getting us back to where the standard level of expectation should be. But that's important to do that first. Improvement is actually raising a standard to a different level, whether it be related to safety, quality, productivity, delivery, all in the end providing better value for the customer. And that's what we're attempting to accomplish, to make that standard better so that we can provide better services and attain that level of performance. There are some significant differences in the lean process than the process that I was taught to follow many years ago. So I, my, one of my first jobs was I was on the uh, 22nd floor of 35 East Wacker setting standards for organizations throughout the United States without even seeing them. And I'm not sure that that's a very uh, worthwhile activity to do uh, without having been boots in the ground to see what's going on and actually identifying what the standard should be and involving people in coming up with the new standard. So our improvement that we're focusing on is not merely telling people to do better and hoping they figure out how. But that's what our focus is, is to create a standard, to identify barriers to improve performance and improve performance, because at any given time, you might find out you need to improve and you'll never figure out how to improve on the day that you need to do it. So we need to be operating as best we can on a regular basis. And that's really what we're talking about as far as improvement. 
So real quickly, the summary on improvement is, is that we have to do a, a, a good job controlling what our costs are. Very few of us live in the world of reimbursements or price, but we all live in the world of every single day making hundreds of decisions that affect the cost of our organization. And it's, it's imperative that we identify what our contribution is and to spend the money we need to and to identify where we're spending something that we shouldn't and try to find a way to eliminate that. So that should never have gone out of, uh, uh, out of vogue and it certainly is uh, more than uh, uh, ever today important to do. The question is, how do we do it and who does it? And these are the two main areas that lean becomes different than any other improvement activity, whether it was re-engineering, total quality management, uh, Six Sigma, all the improvement efforts that have been around have all had the same focus, but been different methodologies. So what's different about lean? And that's what we're doing. So what are we trying to do? Well, what do we improve? We reduce how long it takes to get something done. And you do that not by telling people to work faster. They're already working faster and doing a good job when they're doing the work that transforms whatever's going on to its ultimate conclusion. But what we're trying to do is to identify the unnecessary steps the things that are barriers to productivity so that we can streamline an operation. Uh, it takes about, uh, oh, let's say about two minutes to make a hamburger. And it takes you 20 minutes for them to get around to it. I mean, those are the kind of discussions that people have on a regular basis. Why does it take me an hour to accomplish something that I could do from scratch in a few moments? That's what we're trying to focus on. So instead of working on making people work faster while they're already doing work, a better approach is to address something that we call non-value added time and we'll define that, reducing wasted steps so that I can do more of the value added work without adding more effort. I mean, I have a certain amount of my time during the day that I do work, and if 20% of it is waste and I eliminate some of that waste, I now have more time to do what people see as valuable. And so that's the focus. And that's one of the major differences between lean and virtually everything else. As an industrial engineer, I learned how to watch people while they were doing work and find a way to improve the motion when they were working. But we didn't spend a lot of time focused on taking away barriers to why they couldn't work 100% of the time. That's one of the major changes uh, to the lean process. So we look at a simple graphic, and it really is simple, because we talk about from the moment that somebody calls us up and says, I need your help, from the moment somebody walks in the door, from the moment I open an email or open an envelope and want to process something, how long does it take me until I'm finished, and how many of those steps are valuable to me non, as opposed to I see them as barriers, I see them as red tape, etc. So we talk about the cycle time and the cycle time is how long the actual work takes to get done. And that's all what's shown in green. Everything else that's red are what we call wasted steps, non-valuated steps. And as you can tell from the graphic, there are very many more red bars than there are green bars. And that's in the real world, that's likely to be the case. So we focus on what do we call something that's value-added? How do I know that I have a step that's value-added? There are three requirements for a step to be value-added. And all three of these need to be there for a step to be called value-added. Customer has to be willing to pay for it. That's the first thing. Think about the next time you go to a uh, uh, get your tires uh, uh, replaced and all the, the uh, line items, the, the environmental disposal fee, the processing fee, the sales tax, the, uh, uh, the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards tax, this and that, all these items on the, uh, on the invoice. And, and if we could get away with it, we'd like to say, hey, look, I'm not willing to pay for this. So if I have any step that I'm not willing to pay for, automatically it's kicked out as non-value added. 
Second requirement for evaluated step, it has to be done right the first time. If something, if I do something and it's done incorrectly, then it is all a waste step because that causes, again, a do-over. The third requirement, and again, all three of these have to be there for a step to be evaluated, is the step actually has to transform the product or service or experience. So moving something from one desk to another does not transform the product or service that transforms the, or that uh, uh, transfers the human involved in the process or the paperwork. So that's not transformational. So those three requirements uh, are all necessary for a step to be evaluated. If you look at that, say, wow, there's probably not a lot of steps that we're going to call evaluated. And as you're going to see in the subsequent slide, that's absolutely right. So everything else that's not evaluated is called waste. And that's one of the most fundamental concepts of lean. In fact, it has to be the singular focus of an organization to identify waste and to identify ways to eliminate the reason waste is there so it can go away and it provides more time for evaluated work instead of doing the non-evaluated work. Waste consumes resources and people don't see the value in it. Yet we pay people to do waste and it's usually not their fault. Waste is rarely complete and accurate. In fact, that's one of the forms of waste, having something that's not complete. Uh, get a phone call from, from a hospital saying, oh, sir, we forgot to ask you this information for your pre-admission. Could you fill out another form or could you go back online and do that? That's a form of waste. Uh, and it slows the process down. Waste frustrates people. So why do we focus on waste? Every organization has different instances of waste, but what's been pretty consistent that regardless of whether or not we're a manufacturing company, we're a hospital, we're a governmental agency, we're a service organization uh, or a consulting organization, only about 10 to 20% of the total time that people work is actually considered value-added work. And therefore, up to 90% of the total time that people are working falls into one of the forms of waste that we'll spend a few moments talking about uh, uh, very shortly. Now, waste is a tough word. I, I had a client many years ago that uh, uh, spent quite a bit of time wondering how we could come up with a better word that doesn't make people feel bad when we tell them we're, they're working on waste. Um, and I always thought that it's that waste shouldn't be the concern. If we blame people for doing waste, then that's why people would be unhappy with the word. So whatever you want to call the non-value-added work, it, 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 it's okay. It's not value-added, and we have to try to find a way to get rid of it if we can. And not all non-value-added work can go away. I think I read somewhere where Toyota still has 30% or so waste in their operation. And they've been doing this for over 60 years. Probably the most broad implementation of a lean enterprise there is, more serious about it, more organized than, than many other organizations. And yet there's a certain amount that they know they can't get rid of. Waste frustrates people. They usually are cheering when we get rid of it. Uh, uh, and, and that's really why we're trying to focus on it. So we're going to make improvements on cost. Everybody knows that. What we're trying to focus on is let's not focus so much on when they're doing the work. I'm not telling you there's not improvements that can be made there. But I'm telling you that the majority of the work that people are doing are things that if we found a way to get rid of that, will be in much better shape. So a study was done in construction industry and you send an electrician out to a job site and the electrician's out there and billing you for eight hours. And about 50% of the time is what we would call wrench time. And wrench time basically means doing valuated work, pulling wire, installing conduit, connecting uh, outlets, doing those kind of issues. 
all the rest of the time searching for work orders, reading the order and having disagreements because it was inaccurately stated. The customer says they wanted something different. Oh, I can't find my wire stripper. Where the heck did somebody else put it? All these things that take people away from actually doing their work. And most of that's not their fault. So that's why we want to focus on getting rid of waste first. It usually makes people uh, uh, less uncomfortable and less frustrated to the work they're doing. Now, waste has two forms. It has a form called necessary waste and a form called unnecessary waste. There are certain wastes that we cannot get rid of. People are checking work they do because there is no positive control in some cases and it's beyond our limit, our state of technology or, or we're limited by our technological uh, um, uh, uh, methods that we use so that it isn't perfect 100% of the time. So we have those issues. People are going to be checking certain things. Uh, there are There's waste that's required by regulatory or licensing requirements. I have to go out and, and uh, uh, get a license for putting a deck on my uh, uh, on my house because the village wants to make sure that it's done correctly and they inspect it. I always wonder why can't the person who does the work ensure that it's done correctly? But that's a requirement and it's necessary. There are unnecessary wastes and they exist usually because it was not even intentionally designed the process. We designed a process from far away from the work. We didn't involve the people who actually do the work and waste was put in there unbeknownst to them. Or it creeps into a process after we, after we put something in place and some things come up and say, oh, I didn't have this and now I've got to check something else and I've got to look for this and I couldn't find this. So there's unnecessary waste. So those are the two forms of waste. What do we do with those? With necessary waste, we should streamline it and minimize it. Yes, I may need to get certifications, licensing or do testing but that doesn't mean I should do it ineffectively or inefficiently. So the necessary waste, we minimize it. It's the unnecessary waste that we find the cause and remove the cause so that the waste can be removed. One of the things that's important to understand about waste is that you can't get rid of waste. You can eliminate the cause that exists, the condition, that exists that results in the waste being there. And by virtue of getting rid of the cause of the waste, you can then remove the waste itself. But acting on waste is acting on a symptom and it's not acting on the cause. So we'll identify the forms of waste. A lot of different terms we should use. Everybody has to know the first thing that you want everybody to understand about lean is it's the it's an obsession. It's a culture to identify waste and find ways to eliminate waste because it stands in our way of getting the work done efficiently, effectively, efficiently and to the requirements of our customers. And that's what the focus is. Everybody should understand what waste looks like in an organization. You can use different terms for waste, but very few uh, uh, different forms of waste. There are seven, eight forms of waste. You have thousands of instances of them, but not a lot of forms of waste. So I throw one acronym up and it really makes no difference which ac acronym we use. I've seen Tim Wood, I've seen uh, uh, Downtime, uh, there's so many different ones. What's important is to have people understand what the forms of waste are. The waste of correction, waste of overproduction, motion, then moving material. Motion is usually human movement and, and, and uh, as opposed to material movement. The waste of waiting, uh, waste of having inventory, the waste of processing, doing things that aren't really necessary, but we do them by habit, and then the waste of underutilization. So let's spend a few moments talking about those. And if anybody has any questions or any comments on waste or any examples of any of these forms of waste that you see, 
please feel free to uh, uh, to put them up and we can spend a few moments talking about them. I'm just going to throw out uh, uh, some examples of some of the wastes. The waste of correction. Correction is defined as anything that we do because we're not sure that we did something correctly or we're not sure that we're going to do it correctly or we in fact find out that we didn't do it correctly. So the waste of correction. We have rework, we have defects, we have errors, we have mistakes, we have do-overs, all of those things. Uh, putting the incorrect information on a form. Uh, sending out another email because, oh, we forgot to attach this to the original email, please fill this out. Uh, having having anything that we've done where I've got to tear up, we, we, we go to a, a voter location and we have to spoil a ballot because the, the voter made a, an error on the ballot and we find out because we handed out the wrong ballot to them. All of those issues are forms of waste. They're all waste of correction. There's always a question about my comment about 80 to 90% waste. Years ago, in the field of quality, because quality improvement started first before we focused on productivity in other areas, uh, there was a concept that still exists today. It was called the cost of quality. Many organizations did this tracking. It's a requirement for companies that are in the uh, uh, automotive industry to track their cost of quality. The cost of quality was was defined as any really the waste of correction. Anything that we do to uh, to detect things that are wrong, to fix them when they're wrong, to uh, 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 to resolve issues directly with the customer, and to even focus on uh, on trying to prevent mistakes. And the argument back many years ago was the cost of quality, the waste of correction, is what we call it today, was about 30% of your sales dollar. So if we agree with that, that the cost of quality was 30%, then we say, well, then all other forms of waste are going to make that even higher. So there's a form of waste, the waste of correction, doing something over again. Waste of overproduction, also known as the worst form of waste, because the waste of overproduction can cause almost all the other forms of waste. Producing more than I need right now. Uh, entering customer information on multiple forms. Uh, printing reports that nobody reads or uses. I worked orga with organizations that put in new ERP systems. And we always say, don't print any new report, any report out with a new system and see how many reports people come in ask for. And a lot of times we find out maybe only about 10% of the reports that uh, we are actually producing people use. Or we buy large quantities of forms that might change because of quantity discounts. We bought it pretty cheap, even though we know we're gonna end up throwing it away. That's the waste of overproduction. And overproduction tends to cause almost all the other forms of waste. That's why it's the worst one. The waste of motion, movement of people that doesn't provide value, opening and closing drawers, opening and closing file cabinets, flipping through multiple file folders, looking on a computer screen and not remembering where you save something, uh, uh, using SharePoint but having no control over the uh, method we use to create uh, our, our file naming protocols, the looking or what we call the scavenger hunt. That's what the waste of motion is. Uh, one of the most difficult ones is people spend a lot of time every single day looking for your keys when you're trying to go to work in the morning or your, uh, your swipe badge because you don't know where you put it. That's all the waste of motion. Material movement, moving things that doesn't provide value. Uh, I, moving items around because we don't know exactly where it's supposed to go. So I take them out of my area and I look around and put them in somebody else's area because they're not around. So I just get them in, out of mine. Storing items far away from where they're used because it's easier to receive them there. So uh, uh, so we have, then, and then we have people go over and get them and bring them back and they bring too much and they take them back and forth. So that's the waste of uh, material movement. Waste of waiting. Happens all the time. Think about uh, the old days of a doctor's office that might have had one doctor in three chairs. Now you go to a doctor's office with five doctors and 30 chairs. 
and you see several different people that you have to wait for who all have this level of specialization. We've broken up the work into smaller chunks and, uh, and we don't have good flow. We'll spend some time talking about that shortly. So that's waiting time, idle time. I'm waiting for things. Inventory, the evidence that we overproduced. We have more things on hand, moving things around. Six months worth of forms we bought at a discount in the storage area and we eventually don't use them up. Overprocessing, one of the more difficult ones to focus on, doing effort that doesn't add value from somebody's viewpoint. We've done things, well, why we've done them that way forever, so that must be right. Or we double and triple check or approvals needed to process work even though the approvals don't really accomplish anything. One of the worst forms of waste, and this is one that's missed in a lot of organizations who try to focus on what they call their lean system, is the underutilization of the knowledge of people. And this is also one that's misunderstood. When, it, when I see underutilization, we say, well, somebody's not doing any work, get them busy, even though they're not accomplishing anything. No, we talk about underutilization. We mean not using the people closest to the work for improvement. It's command and control. It's my way or the highway. And most organizations don't run very effectively that way. We have a command and control mentality. So I'm the boss, I boss, you're the worker, you work. How many times have we heard that before? So one of the fundamental tenets of how we do lean, which is getting rid of waste with a focus on improvement, is by the people closest to the work. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. So before we talk about uh, reducing waste, are there any questions at all? I'll leave it open. Uh, uh, if anybody has any questions on one of the forms of waste and uh, uh, anything you want clarification, I'll give you just a, a couple of minutes if anybody wants to put anything up and uh, I'll look at the ones that I can answer successfully. So I'll give you about a minute or two just to collect your thoughts and to uh, think about anything relating to the conversation about waste before we talk about how to reduce it. Just a reminder that you all can enter questions in the question pane by going over to the menu and clicking questions and then typing into that and our speaker will have access to those. So I have a couple of, uh, let's make sure I'm on here. I think I'm on. Um, Casey, am I on? Yep, we can hear you just fine. Okay, perfect. So I have a few of these that I think are appropriate to ask right now. Somebody asked me to go over inventory again. So inventory is evidence that we overproduce. So really when I talk about forms of waste, if I identify, if I didn't do overproduction, I wouldn't have inventory. Inventory are things that are sitting around that we do not need right now. I have a bag of attendance forms that I use when I go to clients and I keep a lot of the forms in my bag and it makes my bag pretty heavy. Um, so that's what inventory is. It's actually just evidence that we overproduced. Um, examples of government organizations that not, do not use command and control. Um, wow. So, uh, uh, so and this is 
public knowledge, so I'm not sharing anything that's a secret. Uh, the Illinois State Police recently uh, was putting in a uh, is is putting in a lab information management system, and uh, uh, and was focusing on process improvement. I spent quite a bit of time with uh, probably four big groups of folks there. And you talk about an organization where we still have terms like colonel and sergeant and, and uh, those kind of issues. And they so they focus on that they know that they can be in the command and control, but they're trying to focus on pushing decision-making closest to the work. State of Illinois has attempted to do that with some of the groups who've worked with them as well. Um, it, it's not only government that acts as command and control. When I got out of university in 75, we still learned about, about managing and not leading. Uh, so there are various instances where there are attempts to focus on that. Uh, uh, yeah, that Casey will tell you the PowerPoint's going to be available after the webinar uh, uh, very much so. Uh, will you address strategies for finding the sweet spot where tracking activity remains value added be be, uh, versus becoming wasteful? Uh, I'm going to hold on that because we're going to talk about that for a f in a few minutes. So let's continue on. Uh, thanks for the questions. And uh, um, let me move that out of the way and let's continue so now so we we said first that we need to find a way to make the process more streamlined do it right the first time uh, reduce the chances of having do-overs or what we consider to be red tape and uh, 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 and that's what we're trying to accomplish and we do that by identifying waste and not having people, oh, I can teach you to type 120 words a minute instead of 100, and you'll do things a lot faster. So we're trying to focus on getting rid of waste, uh, uh, and we and we try to identify what the forms of waste is. I will say one more thing about identification of waste. Actually, two things. One is it's not difficult to find ways to get rid of waste. What's really difficult is identifying what waste is, and partly because a lot of people feel very concerned to say that what they spend a lot of time on is waste. We in organizations have to make it okay for people to say, I think that I spend a lot of time doing this thing and this is waste, can we find a way to get rid of it? And that's what the focus has to be. So it's not difficult to get rid of it. It's difficult even to identify it. So as you go through attempting to identify the first steps in lean, one of the first steps is to talk about what the forms of waste are in your world and identify uh, uh, examples of them so that you can educate people to say, hey, look, these are the things that we consider to be waste. Otherwise, they might not guess what is or isn't waste. So that's really important uh, uh, that we that we bring that up as well. And it's not it, when people do waste, it's not that they're bad. In most cases, they didn't design the process. So don't think about waste as being bad. It's it, but it's something that we want to find a way to remove, and it it sometimes creeps into the system. So now we're going to talk about the techniques we can use to get rid of the forms of waste that we see. Again, reminding you that you cannot get rid of waste. You can get rid of the cause of waste, and by eliminating the cause, then the effect of having waste can go away. So. There are many different techniques. I always think about lean being like having a toolbox. This might look like your toolbox at home. It certainly looks like mine, not a good level of organization. Uh, and boy, if I count on this photo, there are at least 20 tools that I see in my toolbox. And I know in my toolbox, there are some tools that I use virtually every time I do a project. And there are some tools that I've used only once or twice. Uh, and there's a tool I have in my toolbox that I don't, I don't even remember why I have it. So I think lean is like that because lean includes a set of tools that all have a particular application. A wrench is used to turn a fastener open or close. A hammer is used to drive a, a, a nail. A, a level is used to make sure that we have things that are, that are uh, a level, vertical and horizontal. Uh, Tape is used to do sealing around uh, joints. And what's really important in your toolbox is you know what the tool accomplishes. And if you use the wrong tool, it can be dangerous. Uh, lean is the same thing. So we have a series of tools we use for lean. This slide tries to identify the tools with the form of waste that they get rid of, because I think that's really important. 
Uh, nobody wakes up in the morning saying, I think I'm going to use a hammer today. They might wake up saying, oh, I need to hang a picture and therefore I need a hanger so I can install a, uh, uh, a fastener, a, a hanger into the wall. So they're thinking about what they want to accomplish and judiciously choosing the tool that will accomplish that. So the tools to get rid of the waste of correction. What do we have to get rid of the waste of correction? We have mistake proofing. We create standard work. Uh, it's kind of interesting. There's there's standards out there. ISO 9001, the quality management standard, and and all of its variants focus on preventing human error. is is a new requirement of that standard. Has been in aerospace and automotive for a while and medical, but now it's in the regular standard. And that's what the waste of correction is: trying to stop people from being able to make mistakes. Okay, trying to try to implement standard work as well. Overproduction. We have a system where I only order what I need after I've used it up, or I change over really quickly so that I don't overproduce, or I level out the load so that I don't have a lot of stacks of inventory or paperwork in between different uh, people. I have a waste of motion, and I use visual management in the 5S concept uh, uh, to eliminate that. Visual management, make it easier for people to see what they're supposed to do without asking other folks. Do point of view storage. Keep my uh, toner cartridges where I am instead of in a central location. Put people together in, in a war room concept so they all can uh, uh, communicate better with each other. Sorry. Um, waiting, getting rid of waiting, making sure all the assets they have are available to them uh, uh, when they need them and operate 100% of the time. They're available, they're efficient, and they do correct quality. Balance lines, combine jobs back again. We've broken jobs down into two small chunks and that always causes waiting. Waste of inventory, I said see overproduction before. Processing, overprocessing, look at the process and do value analysis or value engineering. Ask questions, why do we do each step? And if you're not sure why we do each step, then maybe you should investigate further as to whether we should continue to do the steps. And then underutilization, which is the last issue that we talk about for today, how do we get employees closest to the work engaged and solving problems on their own instead of just waiting for a few experts to do that? There's four really common tools in Lean, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but you can look at them, uh, and they're not in any particular order of importance. Problem solving closest to the work. We use the A3 concept that Toyota came up with, a very simple problem solving methodology that people can participate in teams for two uh, problems they're solving on, and they know the methodology. They don't have to go to weeks and weeks of, of uh, formal training. That's how Toyota teaches their hundreds and thousands of people to solve problems closest to the work. I heard a term once, 37 hours to do the work and three hours to improve the work. That's your job. I need you to improve the work because you know best how to do it. Visual management, we make it easier for people to do the right thing and more difficult to do the wrong thing with the 5S system, sort out what we need uh, uh, from, from the area that we don't need so we can't use it wrong. Set or arrange everything so we can find it, keep it clean uh, according to the requirements of the job, and then standardize everything and sustain it so that we don't keep going backwards. Mistake proofing, don't allow somebody to be able to make a mistake if it's so significantly serious. Detect the mistake, mistake and act on it. We all go through mistake proofing. We go through a drive through for a, 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 a car wash. You don't get your tire exactly in the right place, but they have the little mechanism that gets it right there. That's mistake proofing. Work combination. combination. Specialization can help quality, but it always flows, uh, slows down flow. And it always causes some people to be swamped while others are not busy. And that's caused by a singular focus on direct labor costs without addressing the ramifications to flow. It's difficult to balance work when you chop it up into two small chunks. We try to put it back together again. So the final issue is who eliminates waste? And that's the folks closest to the work. A lot of reasons. They know more. They see it every day. They're more likely to buy into the decisions if, if they came up with them. My boss tells me to do something and it doesn't work. I say, what should I do now, boss? He told me what to do and it didn't work. I've heard that a lot in a lot of organizations. And people are more likely to find ways to fine tune a process when they own the design. Came from them, 
they'll find a way to make it work and they can see better. We don't say lowest in the organization. We say they're closest to the work and people can see the work better when they're close to it. If you're far enough away from the work, you can't see it. Why would you decide on how to improve it? And that's fundamental to lean. So we change from management to leadership, from planning, organizing, directing, controlling, to turning over control to those who are best to execute. And yes, that's scary. And it's scary because now you're no longer in control on the output. You're in control of how well you educate people, how well you train them, how well you engage them. And that's really what leadership is about. And these are the new behaviors that change managers and leaders. We engage, we explain, we help people improve, we lead by example, we over communicate. I read somewhere where you can't over communicate a thousand times more than you expected to. And it's all about systems thinking. One of the final slides here. We start with the tools and then we realize that we're creating a different kind of a system for the tools, a management system, so that the, the improvements can be sustained. And then after a while, we realize that we're really operating under a different culture of helping people, engaging people, getting rid of waste. And that's the culture that changes our way of thinking. And it goes away from running an event to execute a tool to creating a system that will make it sustainable and part of the operation. You are not a master mechanic just because you know how to use a wrench. If you put in a tool of lean, it doesn't give you a lean culture. It doesn't give you a lean process, but it's a good start. And that's traditionally, traditionally what people do. So we start with tools, we go to management systems, and then all the way through to culture, and it keeps going around and around again. And that's essentially what lean's about. So the overall goal is improvement and cost reduction and focus on cost. But the type of work that we focus on is waste because there's much more waste than non-waste. Statistically, not only is there more, but it's more frustrating for people. So we have to understand what waste is and be able to identify the tools that help us focus on eliminating waste and the people that are going to do the improvements are the ones closest to the work. And we, start, we need to start to learn to engage them, involve them. And if they don't know how, teach them. Because every one of us learned when we didn't know how well uh, to do something originally. And then we go from using tools to having our entire culture. So, wow, tried to put a lot of stuff into a, a little bit less than an hour, and I apologize if it went too quickly. And uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot more to this than just uh, uh, what we can give in this kind of a presentation. I'll leave it open to any questions at all that, uh, uh, that you want to bring up right now. So uh, I'll open up my pane. And uh, uh, anybody that wants to ask anything, please go ahead about anything we talked about today. So somebody asks good sources and how to learn more. Actually, this, this is a really good question. So there's several books out there. I mean, I've, I've looked at maybe only about half of the books out there on lean. Um, for organizations who are the audience today, there's a really good book out there that I would suggest you look at, and that's called Lean Solutions. 
and it's authored by James Womack and his group, the same folks that wrote Lean Thinking. But Lean Thinking tends to focus more on manufacturing. Lean Solutions is more with people that work directly with clients, customers, et cetera. And for administrative and transactional operations, Lean Solutions is probably absolutely, I would say, the best. It's a difficult read. It's, it's very good, but not easy read, but it's really spot on. So anybody wants to look at that Lean Solutions, uh, I don't make any money off of it, just so you know, but it's by Womack, the same folks that wrote, wrote uh, uh, Lean Thinking. Oh, I will say one more to focus on lean culture, the Toyota Way field book. It's written by Jeffrey Liker. He's written several, but don't look for the Toyota Way. Look for the Toyota Way field book. And they talk about the 14 principles of Toyota, none of which say the word lean, because lean is not a Toyota word, by the way. Lean doesn't, Toyota doesn't use that word lean. That was an American word that was coined by Womack and his group. Uh, but it talks about the 14 principles that Toyota operates by which they try to do the most with what they can. And that's a Toyota Way field book. Any other questions? We still have another minute or so. All right, well, I think that's it. I really appreciate everybody showing up and uh, hopefully I gave you something that you can walk away with and uh, uh, please look at uh, additional sources for additional information. Thank you very much.